Hi, everyone. Welcome. Lurking for Legends is a live video cast that speaks to people from all walks of the publishing world. David and I encourage our viewers to chime in with questions for our guests. And please feel free to comment on what you hear on the show. And tonight, Lurking for Legends is exciting to have with us science fiction and fantasy illustrator Christopher Dahl. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Richard. And uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Nice to have you, welcome. Chris. Yeah, we're, we're happy to have you here. Uh, Chris, before we get started, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and uh, maybe what, what you do when you're not uh, illustrating, because I know you do something else. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, I'm uh, Christopher Dahl. I am a science fiction and fantasy artist and illustrator. I come from a very interesting background of user experience design and, and game design. Uh, so it's it, this is sort of a almost second or third career in my life and i have done a bunch of science fiction book covers including the becky chambers wayfarer series for harper collins us and a number of other really fantastic authors uh this, this uh that, that enjoy science fiction illustrating i tend to be sort of a retro science fiction painter i don't do a lot of digital and that's intentional there are a lot of people that do a lot of digital art and while i have done much of that in the past i stick to a traditional painting style and currently i am running a weekly live stream over on twitch where i sort of do the bob ross of space art show every week for my listeners and viewers and it's been uh, it's been a fun time i i do actually enjoy doing a lot of art uh, i'm mostly Mostly book covers, but there's a lot of commissions that that get involved with it. And uh, on the side, my other business that's keeping us going, my wife and I run a small bakery in our hometown, and I bake cookies and pies. So uh, right now I'm living a life of space art and cookies, which is fascinating. <laughs> so talking about your Twitch channel, Chris, um... Twitch has got uh, a reputation for being, you know, a game streaming channel. So what was it that attracted you to Twitch? Oh, great question. Thank you, David. Uh, when I first decided to do a live show, there were a lot of options. YouTube, of course, has live uh, shows and as well as Facebook. I happened to know of Twitch and knew a lot of people who were doing fairly well with it. And you're right. They're primarily gamers. I'll at the time probably 80 90 percent of the twitch audience were people that watch other people play games they do however have a robust art and general topics categories out there and i thought i'm gonna go and get in on this and the model for twitch is better suited for followers and follower retention and follower interaction which translates to subscriptions the same way the other ones do but it seemed to me that you could build a community in a better fashion on Twitch than some of the other platforms. And I, I haven't ruled out going to YouTube or some of the others, but it, it felt to me like that was definitely the place to go. And to do an art stream on Twitch is completely unheard of, of course. Uh, well, not unheard of, but there, there were a lot of people that are doing it. But to me, it felt like a lot of people were were building or doing art live in front of a, an audience but not really paying attention to the audience and, and, and chat. And I wanted to kind of build something that was not only a space and science fiction art channel, but something that had a bit of a community where, you know, I'm, I, I'm inherently a science fiction geek. So I certainly could talk for hours on end about some of the goofy stuff I've learned over the years. And for some reason that that has taken off and become really appealing. So it, I, I look at it as really a chance to build a show in a community and that's what we're doing. I just had my two-year live stream, and it's been uh, my two-year anniversary live stream, and it, it's been growing very well. And I'm thrilled with the the interaction and and that I've had from the followers on there so far. It, it it's a good platform, and I I, I would encourage folks that want to do art-related live streams to consider it because there, it definitely has a more of a fast track to kind of get people involved and engaged. Than maybe some of the other platforms do that's interesting it's something maybe we should look into dave <laughs> see uh how twitch is because facebook's kind of hit and miss especially the way it shows things to everybody and if you don't quick get reminder you know half the time they forget where we're even on so 
It looks like uh, Nicholas Fodor, I'm probably saying his name wrong, but uh, he must be someone who follows you because he's calling you the real deal. Is that a nickname you have or is he just goofing around with you tonight? <laughs> uh, Nicholas has been a great follower for a, a long time. I'm th I'm very thrilled. And uh, I, I'm thrilled that he said I'm the real deal because I do try to keep it. It, it, it. This is something that I, I, I try not to put on a persona. This is really just me just doing the kinds of things I love to do, which is drawing and painting space scenes, whether it's astronomy or science fiction or or some of the more fantastic elements. And I, it's something I've done for so long. And to me, this is just sharing it with the world. So I, I, I try to keep it from being too artificial. And uh, I, I think people see through that. If you if you try to t take on something that maybe isn't true to yourself. Um, and, and for me, I, I, I thought the best way for me to do is to keep it right on the line and say, this is what I do, and we're going to have fun with it. So I, I, I'm thrilled to hear Nicholas say that. He, he's been a, been a fantastic supporter. I've been on several of your live streams um, and seen you actually um, do these paintings and the interaction that you have with your audience. And I've got to say, Chris, it's like I am totally envious of how you m cope with that. I mean, you are so smooth, it is just like crazy unbelievable. And it's like every time I, I watch you do it, it's like I'm I'm just as fascinated by the actual artwork that you produce as, you know, the way that you actually handle it. And it's like, how do you manage that? I, I mean, what's your special technique, as it were? <laughs> uh, heavy drinking before every single session. <laughs> that is... Uh... <laughs> No, I, I actually I, I I do try to keep any any sort of uh, uh, alcohol or other fun things away from it because that that does it, it's a lot to juggle during any one's live stream and the very first time that I decided to fire a camera up even though literally nobody showed up I think I had four viewers including my mother um, it it was still terrifying you're you're doing something that. You, it, it, it's it's kind of scary to do. I'm I'm painting in front of people. What happens if it's terrible? Uh, you know, not just happy accidents. What if it's just horrible and 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 people just laugh at you? Um, that that sort of thing definitely is a challenge, and it's in the back of your mind. And granted, I've now had you know two years worth of experience doing it, but you still get that that little tinge in your gut where it, it it's that bit of terror. And to a certain degree, you have to kind of let go of that and just and, and just just roll with it, really. And and just honestly, what's the worst that's going to happen? It's a bad painting, and everyone laughs and and, and walks away. But uh, I used to practice every painting before taking on the live stream. I do a couple of versions of it, and I stopped that a few months into it. I realized I, I just kind of get an idea and something maybe that I would sketch possibly but for the most part i just kind of roll with it i it's blank canvas and start to finish and i'm calling on a lot of experience that i have had growing up and and over the years of drawing and painting so a lot of the things i work with are sometimes they're things that i've done and sometimes they are experiments but they're using techniques that i have learned in the past so i do have something to call on from it so just kind of getting that confidence in your skill clears a lot of that and i'm able to sort of have fun with it but there's there's definitely a lot to juggle between just running the the basic software to do the stream and interacting with chat who's fantastic and that's a huge part of it and then of course actually like painting and hoping i don't spill paint all over the place or do something silly like that although that can be entertaining too <laughs> so um it, a lot of it's just kind of keep doing it keep practicing and keep going up in front of the camera, take a deep breath and, and just, just put it out there. Yeah. You, you do it so well too. I was watching one of your streams there the other day and uh, I, I was quite amazed at how you can sit there and just paint and talk and it's not talking for five minutes. You're talking for two hours straight. And uh, you know, Dave and I host this show here, but I don't think I could talk that long and come up with things spontaneously the way you do. So, and keep it, you know, kind of uh, interesting for the viewer to watch. But I know I speak for many authors when I and and my uh, wallet when I say that uh, looking uh, we're constantly looking for and buying covers is like an obsession. So I'm thinking that there, you must have uh, you know quite a following being a cover artist. 
And uh, you know, I, I curse you guys because you cost me a lot of money. I, I, I must have 10 to 12 covers right now that I still need to write. And I'm always looking for more. And you know, I don't think I'll ever write to the covers that I have. But uh, So you collect covers. That's fascinating. I yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm, I'm stockpiling awesome. covers, yeah. Well, it's a uh, it's funny the, uh, the the cover art part. I was I started to get some uh, some notoriety at, primarily through the the big ones. Really, really hit big. Uh, the Becky Chambers books were huge, and that that really garnered a lot of attention. But some of the authors that I have worked with who've come back repeatedly for maybe a complete series or a couple of series, their books are getting out there right now. And a lot of them aren't, aren't published through, through big publishers. They're, they're doing this on their own, like probably many of your viewers are. You can tell that they're getting traction because, well, they're writing more books and you can see the reviews coming in and it's clearly something that they're taking on. And I've, I've got to say, I've, I've know about a good handful of art or authors who have, have kept, kept coming back. And that to me shows that they're okay. So they're either collecting, I didn't know that. And if they are, but, uh, <laughs> but most of them have actually, have actually done their publishing. And it's really, it's really great. I, I love working with authors uh, and you know, they all vary. Some of them have very solid ideas of what they want and then what they want depicted visually. And some just have kind of a general idea. And I've, I've been able to work with them to flesh out you know, the themes and, and, and places and vehicles. And I, I know one author in particular went back and said, okay, I'm rewriting how this character looked because you painted it this way. <laughs> and I liked that. So, <laughs> I mean, I kind of felt bad. I don't want to take over the process by any means. I, I but it's, uh, it, it, it's neat to collaborate on these things because I've, I've loved science fiction and fantasy my whole life. So it's it, being kind of a, a small part of it has been really fun. So we've got a question from somebody in the audience, Chris, uh, uh, Hillary asks, uh, can you tell us about the process of designing a cover for an indie author versus the process for a traditionally published author? Oh, great question. Uh, th and thank you for the question. It's uh, it's remarkably similar, and it really depends on the person you're dealing with, whether it's professional, uh, like a big publishing house, which in that case, I would be working with, say, the the art director for a book. And a lot of times there's kind of a few walls up between the book cover artist and the author which, which can be really, uh, really challenging. You, you have to trust that the art director understands the story to communicate the ideas to you enough uh, to, to work on a, on a final design. Um, but in most of those cases, I have still had access to the author's materials and descriptions or, or early versions of the books themselves, which is really great. Uh, however, working with an independent author directly, I, I feel is, is probably... I, to say better or worse is really um, is, is really hard, but it, you certainly can get a clear track to the author's perceptions of what they feel are going on in the the books they wish to write, which is fantastic because the the, the characters and and vehicles, places, and and scenes this is the stuff that the authors have dreamed of, and so I find that I end up working more on a lower level with the story, which is really great. And I've been able to turn out some really fun things. Uh, and and no slant to independent authors uh, or anyone, but sometimes you, you do work with people that don't maybe have as much of a visual sense of what they would want to see. And that's really where the art director at a publisher can be, uh, could be very helpful because they are definitely thinking in terms of visual, uh, visual thinking and, and the book cover design themselves. But either way, wherever possible, I I always want to contact the author in some fashion to to find out what they're actually wanting to work with because I can imagine there's nothing worse than having a book cover suddenly materialize that looks <laughs> nothing like what you were planning on writing <laughs> in one way or the other. That used um, to be a bit of a tradition, actually, didn't it? It's like, you know, you saw the cover and then you read the book and you went, what was the cover about? <laughs> Very much so, uh, especially in the late 60s and 70s, there were a lot of just books that would get published and who knew what they were pulling out on them. I think a lot of times they just would put, there was a, a weird period of time where paperback books had these abstract paintings on them that looked nothing like anything was in the book, but it was recognizable as a science fiction story on a shelf in a, in a drugstore someplace. But um, I, I, I do definitely like working with the authors directly. 
Yeah, I think it's a testament to you that you keep having people come back. Is uh, I always hear that you know you can't judge a book by its cover, but if you're an unknown author, that's how you get known. You get known by the cover because when Joe Blow walks into chapters or uh, Barnes and Nobles in the states, and you know if they don't know your name, they're not looking for you. But it's the cover that draws their eye to you, you know, and then they'll read the back or whatever, and then you know, so they'll take a chance on that book a lot of times just because the cover drew them to it. And, you know, obviously the editing and the story and everything also make them buy the next book. But if your authors keep coming back to you, that's a testament to your cover arts for sure. And it, it, there's a lot of stories that it, it, authors will write, often write multiple books in a series and you really want them to have kind of a similar theme to them. And I, I think even more, more importantly is how does the book cover look in, in an electronic format? If you're going online to an online store, it, the same rule applies. You're going to see a pile of books that probably look a lot alike. And what I've tried to do with my my cover art is sort of channel that retro vintage science fiction look that might make a little look a little less like a photoshopped cover that so many people are doing. There, there's there's a look and feel to books these days that are so homogenous and so similar that I, I often feel that if you were to look at a page of them, you, you wouldn't be able to tell one from the other, just to, if you're looking just at thumbnails or even looking at them on the shelves at a bookstore, they, they, they often look very, very similar. So I, I try to do, I try to take an approach that isn't seen a lot, but is still extremely attractive and will hopefully make the book appear distinguished from the rest of them in, in the stack. So, Following on from that, Chris, um, you know, you mentioned like your style and everything. So, I mean, we always get asked as authors, you know, kind of like who are our biggest influences. So who would you consider your biggest influences in terms of your artistic style? Oh, good question. Thank you. Uh, my favorite book cover artist, there, there's one right now, John Harris out, out, of, uh, out of the UK. And he's been painting book covers for a very, for a very long time. And they're, they're just fantastic. They're kind of abstract. Uh, so he's one of the current living uh, book cover artists that I, I really consider an inspiration. And uh, John Berkey, uh, who was a illustrator for many, many years, uh, did a lot of poster art for Star Wars and, and King Kong movies, the older ones. But his work is so impressionistic so sci-fi it had a very solid style that you would only recognize as a john berkey style his work was all over books and just other artifacts that i had growing up and, and they were things that were just fantastic and didn't look like maybe what you would see in a movie or a tv show that they had a style all their own and even when i was learning to draw and paint growing up that was kind of the style that i emulated so i, I think john berkey is probably the one that i I keep my eyes towards and I, oftentimes on my live stream, I'm painting something that is definitely in a John Berkey style, even if I don't get as good as as how John Berkey did his. He, he was a master, um, but that, that's definitely kind of the area that I that I aim towards. And even some of the science fiction books that, uh, oh, uh, Frank Rosetta did some that were almost in a Berkey style. Oh, no, sorry, Frank Rosetta. Uh, Boris Vallejo did a couple of science fiction books that had that kind of style. So I, these are the artists that I grew up with are, are the, the Vallejos uh, for, for figurative form and, and Frazetta, John Berkey for the hardware and spacecraft. Uh, and then the, the, the sort of movie artists like the Ralph McQuarrie who did these fantastic pieces for the original Star Wars movie as concept art. Uh, Ron Cobb who did... A, a, these brilliant hardware designs for Alien and a number of other movies. H.R. Giger, I've never done anything like Giger, but oh my gosh, his stuff is uh, is fantastic, and I, I would I would love to dabble in that world. I have an airbrush. I, I I would be I could do that at some point. But these are all all the sorts of artists, the whether they are movies or or book cover art, uh, that that stuck in my mind over the years and really drive the kinds of work that I do right now. It's interesting listening to you talk about different things that appear on the covers. And I know what, uh, you know, I actually, myself, I think I need to start writing reverse harem because then I just have to show uh, some ripped abs, a male's ripped abs. You don't even have to show his head and you can put that in every cover and you would sell a million books. 
But, uh, you know, a, a cupboard needs to scream the genre. So when you go into a store, especially if it's not placed in the genre section, you know exactly, you know, there's a dragon on it that's fantasy. And I'm not a science fiction author, but I see with science fiction, that it seems to me that the trend is it's always a spaceship on there. So you can't really make the mistake of, uh, you know, what genre it's in other than, you know, science fiction has some subgenres to go with it. So the cover needs to scream the genre. What's the, what are the current trends in science fiction book cover art now? Is it still the spaceship or is that changing or how is that industry going? It, it, it's still sticking with spaceships and planets. I, I think whenever you show a, a number of planets, especially if they've got rings or multiple moons in a sky, that is science fiction. And, the, the biggest trends are this are similar to what's happening in other genres where you'll you'll get a character that was probably stock photo art with some nice backgrounds uh, cleverly manipulated in Photoshop in into a scene that looks like it could have leapt out of you know a, a, a video game like Halo for instance uh, although that's that's probably an, an, an older analogy right now or or maybe one of the Marvel movies that's that's really the biggest trend and, and a lot of that are people that know how to do um, typical concept art techniques with digital tools primarily i i don't see a lot of people actually painting anything anymore which is really fascinating like like with with brushes and and uh and and, and paint itself and even then when I, even though i do that i do a lot of digital manipulation before it goes to the final phase as well but uh, I, I do think the tools do play a little bit into it, and that that actually dictates a lot of what the final look is going to be. But you, you are correct. If you've got a spaceship and a planet on a book, that, that that's a science fiction book. And if it's got a dragon or somebody carrying a sword or a goblin, that, that definitely falls into the, the fantasy genre. Now, I understand, Chris, um, you're you self-taught is that correct uh somewhat i grew up drawing with uh just whatever i got my hands on all the <laughs> much the annoyance of the teachers i had in school but i also uh i, I also studied industrial design in college at a at a school that included a, a very heavy fine art core curriculum so a lot while i was learning how to draw and sketch vehicles hardware office furniture and those sorts of things we were learning how to draw, paint, and sculpt in in almost a Royal College of Art style. So I was introduced to paint and 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 form, structure, a lot of those types of techniques that are that are core to fine artists. Back when I when I was in college, and I I used a lot of that when I was in game design, and to a lesser degree when I was user experience designer, a, a lot of color theory came into play, but not so much of the of the visual uh, techniques. And, and honestly, for about 18 years, I didn't really touch any kind of art like I'm doing now at all. And it wasn't until I kind of got to a, got to an end point in, in that career, right? It just, I kind of wasn't really happy with how things were going. And it, it, it was for multiple reasons. I could, I was still an extremely good designer. It just, um, there, there were a lot of other factors that, that were involved with me deciding I, I was kind of done with the industry in general. And I started picking up uh, painting again, just on, kind of on the side, kind of as a lark. I, I had digital tools as well, but I hadn't done any kind of creative, uh, especially certainly nothing in the science fiction realm. I hadn't done anything with that in a very long time. And I thought, okay, the tools are certainly there. Let's see what this is going to look like. And that was probably about 2012 when I started started uh, working kind of on the side to see, is this still there? Do I still have this interest and this passion? And I, I found the answer was yes. It was uh, something that had been there all the time. And even though I didn't technically graduate with a fine art degree, I, I certainly had the basis to start from. And I pretty much built a, I, I didn't go back to school for any of this. I decided that, yeah, I could go back for a master's degree in fine art but I knew that there were a number of techniques that I personally needed to explore and learn. And at the time, we we had, you know, 2012, we, we had YouTube. We had a lot of other places you could go to pick up those individual skills. And I thought, all right, I'm, I'm going to put myself on a five-year plan to, you know, learn these 10 different techniques 
um, and, and primarily they were painting techniques, uh, working with different kinds of paint and, and uh, canvases in a very traditional style, as well as the digital tools. And I thought, well, let's see where this takes us. And if there's literally nothing in five years, I'll move on to something else. But as it turned out, I managed to land a few book covers and a few other commissions. So it, there was definitely some promise there. And I, I, I continued on that path ever since. That's wonderful. So, um, you know, obviously you've got a lot of experience in this now and, and you've done some covers for some like, you know, very big names in the science fiction market. So if somebody, um, if somebody was trying to get into that arena, do you have any kind of like tips as to, you know, what's the best approach or, you know, how they could do that? You know, how, how do you start to become a cover artist, you know? Uh, good question. I mean, I, funny enough, my, my daughter even asked me this because she's, she's studying illustration at, uh, in, in Manhattan at the School of Visual Arts, and she's expressed an interest in trying to become a cover artist as well. And I, I would say to anyone asking me that, I, I would give her give them the same uh, the same advice that I that I, I gave my daughter, which is you've you've got to know the skills as an illustrator or artist first, of course. And the best way to do that, if you're in school, great. You you've got you you're in college, learning how to draw, paint, uh, work with digital tools to do illustration. That's the single biggest thing that that you could do to get going build your skills up especially drawing uh, i i think the drawing is the core of all of it. It, it, it i i was a compulsive sketch artist i still am to this day i keep books with me all the time i i have pens within reach at all, all times if if you if you always practice at even the most rudimentary parts of drawing that that's kind of the core of it and then of course learning how to deliver a finished piece whether it's in a digital format or with, with paint ink or marker that that's definitely the kind of the, the next stage of it you'll eventually accumulate kind of a body of work even if it's just like four or five pieces but the goal is to find something uh, to finish something that looks like what you're trying to sell yourself as so if you know you're going to become a book cover artist there are a lot of books probably on your shelves that are things that you've looked at as kind of your your inspiration uh, emulate those uh, i i built probably five or six different templates of my own art as fictional book covers that i put on my my first original website just to say hey i do this and here it is with my artwork i also had some skills in, in doing title design and 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 layout which i accumulated over the years so i was able to build kind of book cover comps and just put those out there and that that'll be your kind of core piece to prove that you can do it and from there it's a matter of kind of knocking on doors and finding people that might want to do books uh do book covers from you the the big publishers they're they're hard to get into there's no doubt about it they definitely want to see some track record of some kind so you certainly can put those on your target of people you want to talk to but it it, it, it is just as easy as sending them what you do uh with, with kind of a small CV and give them samples. They're going to want to know if you can do it and what kind of work that you can do. Eventually, you'll be prepared enough to accept your first offer, whether it's from a publisher or an independent independent author. The independent author is probably probably one of the better places to go because you can certainly find people that would be willing to negotiate a you know, a small fee or a trade of services for even your first. And it, it doesn't have to be a, a gigantic book that, that hits the shelves. If you happen to know an author and you work with that person and that person self-publishes one book, that's a sample of your work on a book. So uh, there's a lot of def there's a lot of routes to get in there. But the, the biggest thing I think is to build kind of a small track record, even if it's just my stuff that looks like a book or I've worked with somebody that, that published a book and we, we, we traded off for it. But uh, yeah, uh, the persistence um, and, and practice is probably gonna be the thing that gets you the furthest along and just a decision of I'm gonna do this and give it a shot. 
I think before we go on, uh, Nicholas has uh, pretty well written a book. You can write a cover for here. Uh, I think he's going to be on your PR team if he's not already. He's, what makes Mr. Dahl so enjoyable is that he has a rare combination of talent, character, experience, humbleness, and adaptability. He's very engaging with his audience, has a tremendous sense of humor, very professional and down to earth. It's a crying shame he is not as known as the more traditional, well-known artist in the industry. And that's why I always come back and watch the streams every week. He is one of a kind. That is very high praise. Uh, yeah, so, you know, you've obviously earned it. And uh, then we have Alexander Marie and says, couldn't have said it better myself. So ah. you're obviously doing something right. Nicholas, you're hired. I swear. Thank you so much. <laughs> And Nicholas, you've been awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Oh my gosh. Uh, no, that's that's uh, I, I I that that that's really awesome. I I'm I am thrilled that I've been able to kind of provide that 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 much fun and and entertainment and, and genuinely a fun experience. So uh, so that's really cool. And uh, don't worry, Nicholas. We'll get out there at some point. I swear. <laughs> more people. More people are knowing. <laughs> so. If me as a, an author who doesn't really know you, and uh, maybe it's my first book that I'm putting out there, and I, I see your work, and I figure oh, maybe Christopher would be a, might be a good fit for my books, what should I consider when I approach you to do a book cover? Oh, oh, great question! Uh, a giant stack of money. <laughs> That's it, eh? Perfect. <laughs> just, just bring the money, and we'll go. <laughs> It's uh, it, that that part's always negotiable, and I and I, I always consider, you know, wh where the request is coming from. Uh, really, the best thing I'm going to assume that if someone's coming to me with a request to do a a book cover is that you know they've written they've written stories, and if it's science fiction and fantasy, these are people that know their world and they know their characters and they 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 know what they're expecting to see, and. Uh, to be to be honest, without any disappointment whatsoever, every author I've worked with definitely has a very solid idea of kind of what they want to see, which is really great. So, so for me, I what I love to hear are what are sort of their favorite scenes or, or their favorite characters or 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 places in particular that have either inspired them to write this or are major scenes out of the book. I I guess in general, be prepared to talk about their stories. Um, which may be difficult to do if you've been in the midst of that gigantic mountain of, of writing a novel. I know there are a lot, so many things going on, and maybe they're in the editing phase where they're just down with some small element, but we don't have to deal with the book cover, so we have to contact this guy. Um, just to remember the most favorite parts of that particular story, uh, even if it fits in with a larger story or a larger section, uh, I, it, that's really the best part for me is to, is to sort of understand where their emotions are with the scenes and the characters it, it's, it's obviously a visual thing so I, I tend to ask very specific questions about uh, places people and hardware uh, to build a nice scene from it but if, if you were thinking about it of what would the movie poster of my book be that that's kind of where my brain goes in terms of constructing what would be a good scene um, so so those are the kinds of things that I I tend to to ask about most often when I when I work with an author. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> am struggling here. <laughs> I mean, I um, I tend to do my own covers, as you know, Chris, and uh, it's like just and speaking for nice myself. Too. Well, thank you. That's actually a, an incredible uh, compliment coming from yourself. Uh, but it's like, I have to say, it's like when I'm trying to come up with what I want to do on one of my own covers, it's like, I often don't have a clue. You know, it's like, I kind of like, I know I want something impressive. <laughs> I want it to look this big. But, you know, I, I often don't know what it is that I want. So you, you, you're right. I mean, like authors kind of communicate in words. That's, that's their natural medium. So it's like, I think sometimes people... You know, authors kind of like have it different, have a difficulty in, in you know speaking like me at the moment. Um, you know, but in terms of like you know explaining what it is that they're looking for, um, do you sometimes get people you know maybe kind of like sending in sort of little pencil scribbles of yeah I want like a stick man riding a horse or you know <laughs> that kind of thing. 
I, I've had a few of those where uh, where someone had a very specific scene or or their own their own hardware that they definitely had an idea of. And a uh, funny story with with Becky Chambers' third book, uh, Record of a of a Spaceborn Few. The first thing I got from the publisher, my my wonderful art director there at the time, Richard Aquin, he said we we need a ship with a nebula, and I and I drew a spaceship that was really crazy John Berkey looking, but it was nothing at all like what it was described. I I just wanted to get a, a a sketch out to them, and what I what I got back, which was really fantastic, uh, uh, Becky Chambers had constructed uh, in her story this this spacecraft. It, it had a very specific shape to it. It was it was this you know kind of Ro- rotating habit habitation uh, facility. It was, it was basically humans were living on these ships, and not only had she described it very well, but she had actually made um, a paper model of it that she'd sent photos of. And I thought, okay, well, that's just totally off. What I did was totally different. So we, I went entirely with her design. It was, it was, a, uh, it was fantastic. Um, but sometimes you get only sort of an emotional. Uh, a uh, uh, vibe, if you will, of what what the author is wanting to go for, and and I worked on a worked on a book cover last summer, and it was the uh, it, there was a, the the sand ship uncertainty was was the main theme of this of of this ship and uh, or this book I'm sorry and the, the author had a very specific idea of what this sand ship would look like, but uh, beyond that, you know, there, he he had to give me the 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 sort of feel and vibe of the story. And we constructed a scene that would imbue some of that emotional quality to it of a very dark, menacing nature that comes from the back cover across the spine of the book that has elements of it on the, on the front cover. Um, but in, in that case, just the sand ship was really the most detailed element of the whole thing. And, and we talked a number of times uh, about it through the uh, through the course of working on the project. But having, even if you just have sort of that emotional flavor, what's the drama of the story? As an artist, I can start com- combining colors and, and and moods, if you will, and visual elements to sort of paint that, if you will. But but always, if there's a very specific piece of hardware that, that helps to have 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 sketches or at least a good description of them, uh, that that that's definitely helpful. And I'm sure as authors, you probably if if you've got a very specific spacecraft there's probably at some point you've drafted a layout or a general like here's where the things different different pieces go uh diagram at some point or another that's always helpful sorry richard am i dominating here <laughs> no 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 i just uh, i know uh, science fiction and cover design is more your bag so uh by all means you go ahead <laughs> Oh, it's the same with dragons too. So, uh, if, if you've got a very specific dragon or yeah, a yeah, fantasy yeah. element, uh, uh, an armor type, you 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 fantasy authors, you're always dealing with medieval armor. So, I know that there's a variety of those out there. Um, so, so yeah, uh, the same rules apply. Really, there, yeah. there's probably uh, there's probably a milieu, a a scene that that you've got a very specific layout for. Um, uh, so, yeah. It, it, any kind of sketches you have is always helpful, uh, although it's not required. But you can get a description, um, a, a tower with five thousand steps leading up into the clouds. I, I, I can work with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just find it amazing how cover artists can kind of turn your story around or make it go off in a different direction. My very first book, Soul Forge. It was 178,000 words long. And when I described to a cover artist who does painting like you do, uh, what the character, one character looked like, he said he's got a white beard and white long hair and he's old and and he doesn't have any pupils or anything in his eyes. So he got white eyes. And so when he sent the cover back, uh, he put a staff in this guy's hand because he thought it was a wizard. And I said, Marco, he's not a wizard. But 178,000 words I've never mentioned once he got a staff. Take it out. And then... So the next four days go by. He's in Italy, and uh, I'm in Canada. So you know we we don't communicate every day, and uh, it sat with me. And all of a sudden, I said, "That's brilliant." So I got back to him four days later. I said, "Marco, leave it in there." And just by him putting that stick in that old man's hand, opened up a universe of. I was only going to write three books, and now I've got about thirty in my head, and it's all because of him putting that staff in the guy's hand, who was never supposed to be there. So. 
it's amazing how uh, artists can inspire the author. All of that uh, inspiration from a stick. Yes, exactly. Yes, <laughs> thirty books out of a stick. Yeah. Uh, all, all cover artists are are are, are failed authors. Uh, we all wanted to be the ones that wanted the story. So, we're, but we're subversive. <laughs> so, uh, it's, uh, it's fun. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Dave. Um, I was just going to say, uh, Chris. So, in terms of the the, the actual covers you've done, uh, do you have any favorites? Or the ones that you kind of like think, yeah, that I really, really love that one. Oh my gosh. Uh, the, yes. Can you say? <laughs> Are uh, you allowed to? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. I don't really. I, I don't want to make anyone feel bad. I really don't. Uh, uh, Bert Oliver, uh, Oliver Boimer is wrote one last summer that I, I really enjoyed uh, working on uh, quite quite a bit. And John Svensson, I've done a number of books for for this author, and uh, I, I absolutely dig. Uh, all of them he's got some really fun series that that are vastly different and and some books that are completely outside of of his own genre even and a couple that i'm working on now that are really cool uh i i i adore those um yeah it, there are definitely some that are that are favorites i love the becky chambers books i loved working on those quite a bit and uh working with becky on her very first one before she was published before she was picked up was probably one of my favorite you know, in, in working experiences entirely there, there wasn't, I mean, the, the, the pressure was on because she wanted this, this passionate project to get out there. And it was one of the first books that I'd worked on with her, uh, with anyone really, actually, she was, uh, she was one of the, one of the first ones I worked with. And uh, I, I, I'm still very happy with how that one turned out, uh, especially since I, I, I feel like we, we nailed the, the, the ship to the point where it's kind of become uh, one of the one of the core elements for her first couple of books, I think it shows up later on. I, I'm just and I'm forgetting. Forgive me, but um, yeah. So I, there are definitely favorites, and uh, and and honestly, sometimes there are some that that maybe aren't aren't quite so. I mean, I, I love doing them, but uh, they're they're not ones that stick in my mind necessarily. Uh, but I do treat every one of them a, as if. The, this is like the, the the next big one. I I going into every project. You you never know where it's going to go, but I I I I enjoy the challenge and and working through the project with with every everyone. So I I always look at them as uh, the, the possibly the next big favorite. So with all of this that you do, the 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 painting, the streaming. Um, baking cookies and and pies and what I mean. It's like, I've got to ask, do you actually have time to read books? And if you do, who are your favorite authors? Uh, Besides David Kelly, Kelly, of course. Well, yes, exactly. Aside from the two of you, absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not me, but David, for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, not as much as I used to, which is really sad. And I burned through a lot of books growing up. I. I remember I, I worked at a B. Dalton store, which was a, a chain store here in the States um, way back when I was in college. And that led to me working at a, a really great independent bookstore out of Flint, Michigan, uh, Young and Welshans, and which is no longer there either. And I, I was in the publishing side of things. I worked for a, 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 a small, not a, sorry, a, dis, a book distributor for a long time. And when I was in college, I hit our libraries constantly. I would come home with 10 or 12 science fiction books. I remember there was about two years when I was in between semesters, I was catching up on every classic science fiction book I could get my hands on and burning through them like crazy. And I, I don't do that anymore, which is really sad. Uh, but uh, m most recently, I just finished the the Expanse series. I, I, I think that James uh, S.A. Corey, the, the two of those dudes, uh, did a fantastic job with with theirs and i i actually just picked up um uh An ancillary sword uh the lackey books uh she's got a really cool universe that i just picked up recently um and, and i was a little late to the game on uh neil stevenson's seven eves but that was a, a really fun story well <laughs> fun and terrifying all at the same time for so many reasons uh th th those are the ones i tend to go for Strangely enough, I I just read a a, a really wonderful. It, it was it's a it's a World War II story. It's about a bunch of people that worked on the the small carriers in the Pacific War 
uh, during World War II. These weren't the big carriers they make movies out of. These were the small ones that were just carrying jeeps and supplies and things over uh, into the islands uh, near Iwo Jima and Lady Gulf. And of course, they got confused as being the big carriers and were chased by the Japanese Navy for days and nearly decimated. But uh, sometimes I go into nonfiction with those. But I still stick with the the sci-fi genre books for the most part. When I go to pick up a book, those are the places that I, I typically go to. That's awesome. So unfortunately, you. we're running out of time here. And uh, yeah, I think we could talk to you for a couple hours like you're, you do on your Twitch program. <laughs> this is and, how it works. I just, I just like spew things and it just keeps going. You do it very well. So, <laughs> But just before we uh, sign off here, you, you run a small bake shop with your wife. And does your artistry seep through into what you guys bake? Does she allow you to do that? Or has it ever been a discussion? Or is this something you don't do? Uh, I, I'm definitely the designated cookie maker, but I do all of the graphics for the website. I've, I've done a whole series of little cartoon characters with watercolor for banners and store materials. When we had a store, we're we're actually running this out of out of our home right now. But uh, ah, tragic story. I used to have an actual bake shop. We don't anymore. But yes, the Dollhouse Baked Goods characters were all uh, characters that I drew and 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 watercolored. So when we Whenever we do special events or or holiday events where we need cards and and, and things, that that's kind of where my my artistic bit comes in. She is the baking artist, so she is definitely the 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 top artist of that that business. <laughs> so that's um, awesome. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dave. No, I was just going to say, Chris, if people want to find out more about you, where where would where would they look? Oh, thank you. Uh, you can go to my website. It's Christopher Dahl uh, with a hyphen in between. Christopher-Dahl.com. I've uh, I, I have a a blog that needs to be updated much more, but that's also where I keep my my online store, uh, where people can buy prints and originals and calendars and a few other fun things. And of course, you can find me over on my live stream on Twitch, where I go under the name of Blackbird CD every wednesday night so uh that's my my sort of nom de plume over on twitch so those are the big places where you can find me and one last question i guess is, do you have a big cover coming out or can you say is this a hush hush like when you do one for harper collins us are you allowed to say anything about it beforehand or do you have to zip it until it actually releases uh, it always depends on the project. I, I have a couple in project the process right now that I, I am working on, uh, and I, I cannot disclose who they are at this point, but uh, I will certainly uh, certainly have them. I'll be talking about them on my live stream as soon as I can. <laughs> okay, all right. I, don't, I don't want to mow your grass here, so we'll just leave it at that. But if any big publishers are interested, they're welcome to contact me at Christopher-Doll.com at any time. So, yes. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you again for coming on. And uh, if you ever want to come on again, Thanks, so Chris. I'll get you back on because I'm sure we could talk to you thank for another you. 45 minutes for sure. So yeah, thank you for all the cool questions, everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was awesome. We had a lot of good questions there for sure. Thank you for chiming in, everybody. And uh, oh, we got another one coming in here. Thank you, Christopher. That was great. Take care, all. So, Dave, just before we leave, uh, is there anything new in the David Kelly universe? Um, yes. I got back my edit notes with red ink from my editor and i am now working through them and i'm about around about almost halfway through so that's kind of like definitely going well and uh, and the other good news is i got a phone call from my garage door guy today and my garage door is actually here Nice, nice. You can't install it because I can't get the car car out of the garage because of the snow. <laughs> but the door is actually here physically. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. So, what about yourself, Richard? What yeah, no. In the Soul Forge universe, I just started. Uh, I recommenced working on uh, Wind Walker Book Three and High Cliff Guardians. I, I I've been uh, kind of remiss in the last few weeks. I've been dealing with income tax and a whole bunch of other different things <laughs> that uh, just totally sidetrack you and. Uh, but I, I just started, uh, I got some good writing done today and uh, things are starting to come along again. So it's coming. Uh, I hope to release uh, Windwalker in June. And my publicist uh, probably won't allow me to officially release it till July or August, but I will have paperback copies in hand by June. We just won't tell him. So Shh. So next week's guest will be fantasy author Kit Davin or Davin. I, I should ask that. I, I, was just, I just saw her the other week. We did a little author event together here in town. 
But uh, Kit Davin, uh, Kit is, I think it's Davin, sorry. Kit is the author of the Weird Science Fantasy Series. And I can't even say the word. It's X-I-I-N-I-S-I. -I -I. I'll have to ask her that before we go on air, too. It's an Exinzi trilogy. It's almost like a Piers Anthony thing here with Exam Theories, uh, which includes The Forgotten Gemstone, The Other Castle, and The Starry Rise. She also writes suspenseful supernatural stories. An advocate for the arts in all its forms, Kit is currently exploring board game development. That sounds cool graphic design, and has been known to paint, sculpt, sew, and act. Wow. Jesus. At the same time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. That would be quite the show. We could put that on Twitch. Mm. It would be rivaling Christopher Dahl. We would have done it on a different day, I guess. But <laughs> Dave and I look forward to speaking with Kit Davin, a Davin. <laughs> we'll figure that out next week. And finding out more about her board game enterprise. It sounds very interesting. So for Christy Stratus, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, David M. Kelly, myself, Richard H. Stevens, we hope everyone has a safe and healthy week ahead. Until we meet again, take good care. Thanks, everyone. Thank